Well, me up, um, and it may have helped some of you up, and I know there are one or two people that will come on in, but we'll go ahead and get started out of respect for people's time. And come on up and you guys make yourselves, we got plenty of seats if you're, you'd like to sit down, please um, make yourselves at home, and we're going to try to film it. Um, Helen, I think you've got a guest you wanted to introduce. Is Helen still? Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't know where, where everybody is. Please, go ahead. Sure. Well, thank you so much, um, Ross, for pulling this together, and just so blessed to have you on our task force. And I'm Helen Kim Ho. I'm um, also a member of the Atlanta Comfort Women Memorial Task Force. And there's our chair, Mr. Roger Kim. Um, thank you, Mr. Kim, for showing up. And there's several other members um, of our task force here. But I wanted to first, you know, we are in Brookhaven, which is a wonderful city, very diverse city. And I wanted to recognize and ask um, Brookhaven City Councilman John Park, who actually attended our first in-person task force dinner when Congressman John Lewis, I mean, that's my boyfriend, <laughs> other boyfriend, <laughs> Congressman Mike Honda, when he flew in from San Francisco just to join us. And um, John, Councilman Park, joined us at that dinner and was very supportive of our efforts. So. Councilman Clark, can you welcome us to your lovely city? Oh, uh, I'll keep this short. Uh, welcome to Brookhaven. Uh, this is our, I see it's fairly new. It started in 2012. Uh, been councilman for several years now. Uh, one thing I will say that I was actually a history major in college. Mm -hmm. uh, and for sometimes, you know, and I studied a lot of things like this. I studied Japanese history as, as well as Asian history in general, as well as, you know, you know all the survey courses. Uh, but this one was, a, like so many other things, was a, a little bit personal for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, thinking my, about my grandmother, who during the occupation was not allowed to speak Korean or anything like that. So, um, with that, welcome to Brookhaven, and you have my full support in everything that you do. I'm Dr. Kelly Hahn, um, and I were talking about. Uh, He's my doctor, um, <laughs> and we were talking. I was calling him because I had, a, I think, an infection or needed some antibiotics or something. And he <clears throat> mentioned to me what was happening, and I'm just, I have so much respect for him and for his family and um, his integrity. Um, I've, I've been through a lot of different challenges in the healthcare system, but when he shared with me what was happening, um, he was gracious enough to connect me with Helen and. I admire so much the work that, that you've done on the task force, and I think Dr. Ahn is on the task force, and I know many of you. And who is on the task force that's attending today? Thank you for doing this for our, our community. <clears throat> it's such a, to me, if we can't be honest about the past, we can't address the challenges of the present and hope for a better future. And that was the tragedy here. And I, I, I think the New York Times, um, the, obviously the Atlanta Business Chronicle has already written an article. There, there are a lot of things that are, that are going to, I think, come to the surface and the forefront in our community. But it was very disappointing. Uh, and Helen, you guys know that. And, um, I think it's nine U.S. cities that have a, a memorial in 52 countries. And we're one of the very few cities that has made this kind of commitment where we signed a, a, an MOU with our unique Heritage and History with Dr. King with the National Civil and Human Rights Museum and then announced the press release, announced the date, so that they went ahead and ordered the monument, uh, the memorial, and then they retroactively created a no monuments policy. And the irony is that National Civil and Human Rights Museum houses a letter from Robert Woodruff that he wrote in 1964 when Dr. King won the Nobel Peace Prize. They wanted to honor him at the Commerce Club downtown and nobody, they could not sell any tickets. They did not sell a single ticket. And they spoke to Robert Woodruff about it, and he wrote an open letter in the Atlanta Journal and Constitution and said, you know, this is my home, and I'm very proud of Atlanta. Georgia's my home state, but Coca-Cola has become a global company. And if this is the kind of city that can honor our first Nobel Peace Prize winner, then maybe I need to look for another home for Coca-Cola. And within two and a half hours, that event sold out. <laughs> and that letter is in the museum. Yeah. Um, and so now it's our business community, with, unfortunately, uh, with the Metro Chamber asking through Dave Williams going down and asking Pedro to pull the bill uh, with, with, with that was honoring comfort women, with them putting pressure on the museum to reverse the vote, which they did do. And this is not denigrating the perpetrators. This is honoring the victims who have been 
marginalized and pushed aside for so long. And this is not a Japanese-Korean issue. Obviously, I'm neither one of those. Um, this is a human and civil rights issue. There are over 13 countries, more than 200,000 women. So Sylvia, Matt and Sylvia, Sylvia Yu uh, Friedman and Matt Friedman did a, come on in, well, Mark, did a, um, they did a 27-city, 70-day, 112 presentation tour of North America this past summer. Um, and they called me after I hosted them in Atlanta and helped with some other cities. Matt has been doing abolition work for 27 years in 42 countries with the UN, the USAID, the State Department. Sylvia is an award-winning journalist in Hong Kong. She's from Vancouver, Canada. Matt's from Connecticut. Sylvia won the 2013 International Human Rights Award um, for the press uh, for her work on comfort women. She spent over a, a, a um, Ten, over a decade writing a book, Silence No More, about the comfort women. There were over a thousand rape camps in China alone. And there were over 200,000 women in more than 13 countries. And people from all kinds of nationalities uh, were affected by this. Um, and you know, one of the arguments I think that the Japanese constantly tragically used, and one of the beautiful things is Sylvia's, and I'll let her introduce herself and show the film, but she's gonna highlight Japanese citizens that took responsibility for this issue and went all over China asking for forgiveness and trying to bring healing and restoration. This is a human issue, not a Japanese Korean issue. And it was very offensive to me as I talked to Ambassador Young twice about this, that um, the Japanese were saying there are 10,000 Japanese and 50,000 Koreans, this is a Japanese Korean issue. And we're gonna really pull back on our civic support and we're gonna, this is gonna really affect the economic relationship between Georgia and the Japanese. Um, and, uh, and they were even saying that our children are gonna be bullied in your schools if you have this company. And that is very offensive to me. I don't remember the German government when we did the National Holocaust Museum saying our children are gonna be bullied in the DC schools because they sought forgiveness, they made reparations, and they sought to reconcile in that tragic event. And the Japanese have not been willing to do that, frankly. Some have, and Sylvia will highlight that. That's not the position, unfortunately, of their government. And it's embarrassing to me that our community did not show leadership on this issue. It really is tragic. But it's not over yet. Uh, the best is yet to come. And thanks for being here today. And I'm, I'm so honored that Sylvia is here from Hong Kong. And um, she is one of the leading experts on comfort women in the world. She's talked to government leaders in D.C., The Hague, Tokyo, Seoul, Korea, uh, obviously written a book about this, done documentary films about this, and has been recognized internationally for her work on this issue. So please join me in welcoming Sylvia Yu Thank you so much, Ross, for bringing us together today. Um, <laughs> I, I'm very moved because when I first started researching this issue in 1999, Nobody knew about this. Nobody knew about comfort women. Nobody really cared about comfort women in the Korean communities. And uh, so I'm just moved that, unfortunately, it's through controversy that um, it's, it's piqued more interest and, and raised awareness of, of this terrible, uh, one of the greatest human rights tragedies in, in the 20th century, if not the 21st century as well. Um, just a minor correction, I, I, my award wasn't for comfort women, it, it was for a sex trafficking, human trafficking series in China, Thailand, um, and Hong Kong. Um, but uh, my calling is as a journalist to be a voice for the voiceless, and uh, I primarily focus on reporting on human trafficking in Asia, and I expose it. And I tell the stories uh, from the victim's point of view. Uh, so that it will hopefully touch the the government and the policy makers and um, you know lately big stories have been falling on my lap effortlessly um, i expose sex trafficking in the hong kong bars and the hong kong police and government have been denying that there is sex trafficking happening in hong kong even though the police station is like 10 feet away from the bar street and, uh, and my article definitively wrote out that the Filipino women are brought in fraudulently on domestic helper visas and they're um, slapped with a huge debt bondage and they can't get out. And uh, so my film, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more after, um, 
And uh, I, I was able to make this documentary film. This is a 20 minute version. We have a 30 minute version, but um, you know, for the sake of, of touring schools and universities, uh, we made it shorter. Uh, with a Chinese Singaporean executive producer, myself, a Korean Canadian screenwriter and interviewer, and a Japanese, um, the leader of the reconciliation team, Tomoko Hasegawa, uh, we spearheaded this. Uh, <coughs> documentary to, to write the story of this courageous Japanese uh, team that felt compelled to say sorry to the uh, victims of comfort women in Shanxi, China, because their own government failed to give an apology. And they paid uh, for the trips, they paid for the gifts, they prepared dances, they prepared a huge uh, poem and sign saying they're sorry. And uh, in, in the streets of, of China, e even in Nanjing and Shanxi province, they were they bowed on the ground. And the passers-by, and we didn't capture this on camera, but the passers-by, they wept. They wept upon reading this. You know, these are people several generations after the war. But there's so much vitriol and hatred in mainland China against the Japanese. And I think it's, it's still this uncomfortableness among the Korean community, even in the diaspora. You know, there was a, a recent uh, controversy over the statue in Sydney, Australia. Same thing, Japanese consulate pressured. And in Glendale, California, uh, San Francisco, but San Francisco, the, the, the Asian community is quite strong politically, so they were able to push it through. Uh, again, in New Jersey, um, and uh, Toronto, Vancouver, same thing, fighting. All, all over the truth, because the Japanese consulate, they're afraid to publicly say, you know, or publicly have a, a, a peace monument saying that this is what happened to the women. And I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, and uh, so now I'll play the film, and it's really about the power in a, of an apology. Um, it doesn't come from the government, uh, therefore it's not as powerful, it's not what the women uh, ultimately want, and they have expressed that they want their dignity back, they want recognition, and, and that the only way that they can think of how to get that is, is from an official apology from the Japanese.从一九三一年到一九四五年，日本军队在中国和亚洲的占领地，都设立了被称为“慰安所”的军用妓院。成千上万的妇女和女孩被贩卖或强迫，成为日军的性奴隶。日军给这些妇女取了一个委婉的名称：“慰安妇。”因为他们的任务，就是为了慰安在前线作战的官兵。最初建立的慰安所中的女性，多是来自日本和朝鲜的女子挺身队。随着在中国战线的扩大和延伸，日军开始在各地大批强行劫掠中国妇女，充当慰安妇。一九四五年，随着日本的投降，所有的慰安所顿时彻底消失。
大部分被逼成为性奴隶的二十多万中国妇女被日军杀害，只有很少一部分人侥幸存活了下来。其中，经历了无穷岁月和难言羞辱的摧残，幸存至今的更是少之又少。楼里拉不长久，我这是整点楼还死的，这想这就矿的都不行，这地方上，我啥还怕娘笑话了，娘是不怕，咱这事情就不怕笑话，啊，娘可是娘都楼了还在浪费了，是的，所以呢。在山西，像郝月莲一样，遭受日军性奴隶制度所迫害的妇女还有很多。七七事变，又称卢沟桥事变，是日本全面侵华战争的开始。山西省位于华北平原北部，地处太行山以西，战略位置显著，是侵华日军的重要根据地。据不完全统计。仅一九四一年到一九四二年这两年时间，日军在太行地区就杀害无辜百姓三十五万人之多，强奸妇女成千上万。一说过的，就这点觉得，这点好点点事。不如干事干的就，上一次差不多，俺们跟我老了就是，打那眼霜，打眼眼，我是两嘴也是，两眼眼不干净，上，上了眼眼，眼霜对了了，三天啊，回来
每天来扎嘞，每天来扎嘞，扎到把家里的老吃害的，该最后一天了，最好嘞把他带走，把俺爸爸拖的远儿，好好跳住，好好踩踩，烧的脸长，但是，我这过得拖的了，我一边哭一边拖了。你要把我拖在，你叫俺妈爷爷让好我。要要把我拖在啊，拖好我就出来走了。你要把把时候在月儿，丢俺妈，把我也不知好在哪狗住了了些天。好在不得，咱不知道伢是哪儿了，不得喝家儿，干后的逍遥过来些伢是在搞大好了，睡的，我对不对？我在喝家人家睡小觉了，就叫嘞，住了四五天，感觉好好，没别的，子弹把我买出来，好的喝的，在伢喝的强强家住了两天，住了个七天，把我送回来，送回来俺爸爸死活，他都喊的哭了，还那那没路了，就是俺妈和我，俺哥哥人家就跑都不在家里了。跑都不在家里，他就不敢回来，把家儿收藏哎，没办法，我后头来我在家里住了，睡了一夜多呀，慢慢的好了。俺妈是回来了，换伢子，换家都把俺爸爸那没了。我往房不打烊，谁也不说。伢子我说你再再再难够着嘞，我说俺跟伢刘海海嘞。再不说了，至少再不说，搁这儿就家伢也还还没那写的说了，是你的呀，我叫你都八十一了，我我啥啥啥啥也是活。他们试图通过日本的法庭向日本政府索取道歉和赔偿。收他还没他不赔偿道歉。咱收他还不得收起来，是得收他还的意思。嗯，这咱老了救出来亏钱，就是打了汪汪了。你说你咱不晓得还不还哭？嗯，就是实在那伢子呀。但是，日本政府至今还没有为强迫几十万妇女和女孩成为日军性奴隶的制度承担法律和道德上的责任。他们不愿意给李爱莲和几百个将要垂死的老人一个正式官方的道歉。哎，问你是，你先去给拉一拉是吧？啊，对。现在这个技术和管制，在日本政府这个态度的这个不公正的情况下是摆出来，但是很。现在就更需要这些日本的这些板平，日本的政府呀，这更多的团队来给他们扶持这个这个心理上，上非常重要。当所有的诉讼都失败后，这些老人觉得非常失望，有几个甚至陷入抑郁状况。秋月，新加坡人，英语老师，在二零零六年，通过张双斌老师和当地导游的帮助，见到了山西盂县和沁县周边地方的慰安妇，开始动员日本基督徒过来，向这些老人和家人道歉。In God's ways, and that is through sharing the gospel with both people. I mean, both countries and peoples need to come to acknowledge God as their Lord and Master before they could be set free for the Chinese for unforgiveness and hatred against the Japanese. And on the Japanese side, okay, the ignorance and distortion of history, okay, which is the truth. I think only God's truth. May the gospel could set them free, these two people free, to be able to reach 
make a permanent and eternal reconciliation. This Yi是如何好 team, called Yi智大河, Caihong之墙. They came to China. 代表他们的国家与民族表示悔改，向老人道歉，并把福音分享给他们。他们为历史的创伤带来医治。同时，他们也把这个医治带给老人的孩子。二零零八年，他们也来到山西。我是。嗯，公开一緒に行動しました。代表日本人。嗯，そして皆さんが過去に。過去な日本。取り扱われたことは、過去で言うできました。そうだ、変大だ。過去の死を受けて、うん、受けて、死を受けて、死を受けて、死を受
。多年来，这些老人都一直等候从日本政府得到一句道歉。现在。因着伊志大河、彩虹之桥团队的道歉和福音分享，他们终于可以得到属灵的永恒医治<笑>为了历史不再重演，年轻的一代必须要记得曾经发生在这些老人身上的事迹。他们的创伤和历史的创伤，必须要得到医治。我伫立在这片宽广辽阔大地，为这个领土献上祝福。我俯瞰着大河，寄望千山万水、明月星辰能够永远灿烂耀眼。请原谅，我侵略过这大地。践踏万民的人格尊严。现在，我们放下刀枪和火药，用真心真意献上深深祝福。我听见你们在心中不断呐喊：“愿青山绿水恢复容貌。”愿天地万物能恢复绚烂色彩，愿擦干每一滴眼泪，一切悲伤，愿擦干一切的眼泪，悲伤。
Uh, but again, I, I just want to emphasize this is not a Korean uh, Japanese issue by uh, any means. And um, I'll turn on my PowerPoint if I could get some some help. And I'll, I know I don't have a lot of time. But comfort woman is a euphemism for mostly girl children under 15. And uh, it was a, a system of sex slavery that was masterminded by the Japanese government and military to prevent the Japanese soldiers from raping the local women and girls. Because if the army and the Navy would rape the local people, the local women, then it would be harder to suppress and control them. And also there was the risk of um, sharing or passing on uh, sensitive uh, information, like through espionage, and uh, so initially they sent Japanese women, and, and this system uh, started in 1932, and uh, the first comfort stations were in um, northern China, and the first batches of women were Japanese, but they were in their 30s, and most of them had STDs, and the soldiers contracted these VDs and were unable to, to fight. And so that's why they went younger and younger, using brokers and middlemen in the colonized countries. And because Korea and Taiwan were colonized before the war, um, most of the women early on in the war were from these two countries. And then later it expanded as the Japanese military spread out and conquered different territories like uh, even Hong Kong has several comfort stations that I that we discovered, and it shocks it shocks Hong Kong people. You know, they, two at, at at schools, and um, so in Hong Kong it, they spread to Singapore, Burma, Malaysia, uh, Taiwan. Um, you know, you name it, East Timor. There were Australian nurses who were comfort women in in Hong Kong, um, Dutch women who were prisoners of war. Uh, in Indonesia, because the Dutch had colonized Indonesia before uh, the war began. Um, but about that film, sorry, I, I forgot to mention that um, I, I've lived and worked in mainland China for about eight years, uh, and have lived in Hong Kong with my husband for over five years. Um, and the, the film, it, it touches people. It touches the Chinese. Uh, this is my first time showing a big group of Korean well, I think there's a lot of Korean people, but uh, I've mostly campaigned to Chinese people, and they have been touched. And it's 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 the act of this grassroots team that almost dislodges the bitterness and um, gives them the space to even think about releasing that kind of generational bitterness and hatred towards the Japanese. Um, I want to read out because we're in the great city of Martin Luther King. Uh, Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And, and this Japanese team, um, you know, at the risk of their own reputation in Japan, because activists who talk about comfort women and rape of Nike, they're, they're so persecuted. And Dr. Yoshimi Yoshiaki, who wrote a, a seminal book on comfort women, he's received several death threats. Um, Takashi Yumera, uh, the first journalist to write about comfort women in 1991. He, he received so many death threats, and now he's teaching in South Korea at a university, trying to bridge the two countries because the university that was about to fire him came into right-wing pressure. And right-wingers believe these women were not forced, but that they were voluntary, well-paid prostitutes. So Kim Sun Duk, I met her in 2001 in Washington, D.C. Um, she was filing an international lawsuit under the Alien Tort Claims Act, uh, which allows uh, countries uh, to sue uh, other countries from the United States. And because of their lawsuits in Japan were exhausted and didn't go anywhere, uh, even though the judges recognized that these women suffered as sex slaves, but they said, uh, because of the statutes of limitations, um, you know, it, it's over 20 years, um, they cannot, the judge cannot do anything. And so as a last ditch effort, these women have gone through very various routes, the ILO, 
uh, the EU, Canada, the United States, different lawsuits, and Kim Sundok was a plaintiff in, in that lawsuit um, that she launched in DC and spoke at a press conference. And she was a teenager when she was deceived. She was promised a job as a nurse. Um, and, and she waited until her cousin passed away, um, or actually her partner passed away, and her cousin didn't want her to go forward because she felt like, wow, you know, why would you do that? It's so shameful. Um, and, but she, she went ahead and she spoke about what happened to her because she was compelled to tell the truth. Um, and there were up to 200,000 victims. Uh, there's a Chinese scholar who, who believes that there were 200,000 Chinese victims alone. Um, but I stick with the up to 200. It could vary between 80,000 to 200,000. Um, and if these victims stood shoulder to shoulder, they, it would be from Johnson City to uh, Nashville. That's, that's how many victims there were. And they were all over the Japanese Empire, over a thousand rape stations or comfort stations. And the euphemism comfort woman was because they were to comfort the Japanese soldiers and help them perform better on the battlefield. Um, over a thousand in China alone. And isn't, isn't that um, mind boggling? And all over the Japanese Empire. Um, one, one survivor, uh, Li Yongsu, she was in a conversation in Taiwan that was bombed. So these women are right on the front lines with you know bullets and bombs going off. They were almost <coughs> forgotten, and uh, many of you already know this. Um, due to shame, you know the the women, you know even in the U.S., it's still taboo to talk about um, rape or sexual slavery or trafficking. Um, and uh, Kim Hak Soon in 1991. Uh, she stepped up, that was over uh, about 50 years later, after the war ended, and uh, she decided to go against the grain because she saw a news report that said the Japanese government called the comfort woman voluntary, voluntary prostitutes. And that so outraged her that she decided to speak to the international media. And that was my connection to this story because my mother read a newspaper article in the Korean newspaper in Vancouver, and she told me about comfort women. And uh, that just, it, it blew my mind. In China, the victims are even coming out last year. And for reasons, because of the Cultural Revolution, um, the famine, uh, you know, you name it, the political instability, it wasn't until the last few years that the central government has really come forward in support of, of this issue and, and they've even made a really big uh, museum devoted to this topic and I'll, I'll talk about that later. Wan Aihua, she was the first Chinese survivor to speak out and join a lawsuit. Um, she was raped up to five times a day, captured three times actually, uh, and uh, she kept fainting you know, when she was telling us her story in Shanghai, and she had to travel from Shanxi um, all the way to Shanghai, which took several hours. Uh, she was 83, 82, 83 when we interviewed her, and uh, I was really struck by um, how traumatized she was, even, you know, how many years, over 60 years after her ordeal. Ellen van der Ploeg, um, was a, she has an Indonesian mother, a Dutch father, she was a prisoner of war, and she was plucked out of the POW camp, which is um, against the you know, international laws. Um, and she was uh, 17, 18, she just finished high school, and she was forced into the comfort station. Um, and she was very silent about this issue until another Dutch uh, survivor named Jan Ruff O'Hearn, who was inspired by Kim Sun Duk, I mean Kim Hak Soon in 1991. And Jan Ruff O'Hearn decided to go forward, and that inspired um, many other Dutch women to also testify. And Ellen sadly died uh, in 2013, but her testimony was very instrumental in the EU, in Canada, in the US. Um, you know, especially in the U.S. with the motion, um, 
the bill that Mike Honda um, uh, was re responsible for bringing forward, calling on the Japanese government to apologize and to take legal and moral responsibility. Uh, but she never lived a normal life, uh, was never able to marry, um, was full of uh, hurt and bitterness. You know, it, it uh, was really, yeah, really sad to see. Hong Gumju, I interviewed her um, a few times in 2002 and then 2004. Um, she lost control of her bowels uh, because she was raped by up to 30, 40, sometimes 50 men a day. Uh, she was sterilized with an injection called 606 that made her infertile. She was never able to have kids. Um, she was promised a job, um, you know, working in a factory. Uh, she is from North Korea, but, you know, at that time there was no division. Um, but uh, there are many North Korean uh, victims and survivors, and North Korea is quite supportive of this issue. It's actually one of the only um, issues that North and South really agree on. And uh, if, you know, my friends have gone to North Korea, and um, there's anti-Japanese slogans everywhere in Pyongyang. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, but Hwang Gumju, it really is a North Korean who uh, walked. It took her two and a half months to walk home from China. She was she was uh, forced into sex slavery in China. It took her months to walk home. Uh, she was never able to marry. She um, was a peddler on the streets. You know, really eking out, barely eking out a living. You know, and. Um, and then later she was able to uh, start a little tiny restaurant, you know, making kutsu, like soups and you know, things like that for people. Um, and her adopted children, she adopted some children and, and I think that's what enabled her to survive because she had a reason to live. She had to um, help, you know, it's the Korean War orphans and take care of them. And they later said that um, to it, another NGO person who told me, uh, they said that their mom has so much anger, so much hatred, and uh, it's hard to be close to her, you know? So it, it, it's just really sad, the, the impact. Uh, Wang Nai Nai, uh, she's the one on the left. We call her the happy grandma. Um, she became brighter after the Japanese team um, apologized. She was the one who wept when the Pastor Fujie said sorry. And Pastor Fujie was uh, the first Japanese man that many of the Chinese survivors had seen since they were raped. And so, it, you know, it was very powerful, very healing for her. Um, she was 14 years old when she was raped repeatedly, sometimes overnight. She was captured in her village. The men that she was captured with, several of them were just killed. Uh, her and the other girls, um, I'm, I'm assuming they were as young as her, um, yeah, they were, they were kept, and then when she was no longer useful, they threw her out on the streets and left her for dead. Uh, and then by divine coincidence, someone found her and, and dragged her to her family's home. Um, but Wang, she, she is simple, but when we interviewed her, she said, yes, she wants an apology. You know, it's, it's not about the money for her. So before these women were, um, you know, just regular people, I often wonder, wow, you know, what if it had been me? You no, know, that's when I was 15 and my mother told me about Kim Sun, Kim Hak Soon. I I kept thinking that, what if it had been me? I'm the same age as Kim Hak Soon when she was first taken to North China, and uh, you know, the the woman on the left is Chen from Taiwan, and um, she suffered tremendously, uh, you know, raped by multiple men a day um, but the sad thing was when she you know she adopted children and when she came out with her story her children um, you know abused her verbally and were ashamed of her and she didn't allow me to use her real name until the last few years I, I saw her in the newspaper clippings um, advocating in Taiwan for an apology from Japan and I saw wow she used her real name and so maybe her children came around. And there was another Filipina uh, victim uh, survivor that I interviewed, and the same thing. Her children uh, despised her, you know, for going through that. So it's it's just it's mind boggling why uh, the reaction is is that way. And uh, Jan Ruff O'Hearn, I mentioned her. Uh, she's the one on the right, um, Indonesian mother, a Dutch father. Um, uh, she was 19, and she was raped. Uh, 
you know, dozens of times a, a day, night. Um, she even cut her hair to make herself, uh, you know, unattractive, but that caused the soldiers to even, you know, become more curious. Um, one of the most traumatic things she said was um, a doctor that came to the comfort station to check on the women to make sure they were okay. You know, and this was part of the whole like meticulous um, organizing of the Japanese government and military. The military doctor would check her and then he would rape her. And that created a fear of medical doctors even in her old age. And she was never able to have a normal marriage. Even though she was able to have two daughters who have vowed to keep fighting for an apology after their mother passes away. But the impact Lifelong, lifelong. And um, yeah, if they lose their dignity, you know, some of the women uh, I've interviewed were raped by up to 50 men a day. And, and that's why the Japanese soldiers refer to them as chosun pi, which means toilet, public toilet. So these women were in stalls, you know, and it's, it was like a, you know, a, a reproductive or, you know, a production line. You know, where, and, and some of the men, the soldiers lined up so long and the women um, didn't have time to eat. And uh, Professor Yoon, who's, who is one of the first to bring up this issue in Korea, um, she told me that, you know, some of the women had to eat bread and then they were still being raped. You know, they had no time to eat. It was that cruel. And years later, it, it costs the women everything everything. She has nothing. No shred of dignity, so much shame, not able to marry, and this is at a time when you had to marry. You know, if you're not married, you're not a person, right? In China, it is that way, isn't it? Um, yeah, it cost her everything. She lost everything. And this is what I really want to drive home every time I speak, and I'm hoping um, the people of Atlanta will will know these women are not seeking uh, you know money they're not seeking fame they're seeking recognition they're seeking an apology they're seeking peace and that it would never happen again several of them have have said to me I I don't want women and girls to be raped in war and so they've linked it to um, the issue of of banning um, rape as a weapon of war and sexual violence. And, and this is the longest running activist movement in the world, um, sad, sadly, because there has been no closure and no justice. Why else is this problem um, important or this issue important? It was government run. Um, Yoshimi Yoshiaki found 529 documents, uh, most of them from the Department of Defense, that links directly to the military and government, 529 documents. And there were, he, he found it very simply, actually. <laughs> you know, um, Yoshimi Yoshiaki, you know, before the 500 documents, he found, you know, the smoking gun. Um, and, and he was able to go forward with it. And uh, he, you know, he's one of my heroes. Um, you know, despite the death threats, he stands <coughs> for the truth. And he's a soft-spoken, gentle, very kind man, um, you know, who doesn't seem to be afraid. And why is this still, you know, cropping up? Many people have said, well, the Japanese government have apologized many times. You know, government officials have issued apology. There's the Kono Statement from 1993. Yes, and, you know, even in the, uh, the Comfort Women Japan Korea Accord, there was, uh, you know, a sincere apology, you know, uh, they said sincere apology. Um, but they backtrack and they, you know, Abe is here with a, um, a Shinto uh, priest and uh, heading to Yasukuni. And, um, you know, so many officials, you know, even after the apology and then we hear news of they're going to Yasukuni again, the prime minister. <laughs> Or they've approved um, right-wing history textbooks that minimize comfort women, minimize rape and Nanki, minimize um, Japanese aggression in Asia during, uh, before and during World War II. And uh, so that's the heart of it, really, right? That 
if the apology is not sincere and not touching people like this. German Chancellor um, Willy Brandt knelt spontaneously at a Holocaust memorial in 1970 in Poland, and he said, we are sorry, we're sorry, with tears in his eyes. And the Holocaust survivors and their children said his apology brought healing and release. And that's, that's what we dream of, right? What if um, Prime Minister Abe knelt on the ground, you know, in front of the survivors and said, we are sorry, you know, and then he would stop going to Yasukuni Shrine, which is like a shrine to Hitler, you know, the German equivalent. It's like a shrine to Hitler. Because in Yasukuni Shrine, there are several Class A war criminals who are worshipped there. They're worshipped. And they were never brought to justice. There are Nazi hunters. And they will grab 90-something-year-old elderly men and they'll throw them in prison, right? To satisfy the, the Holocaust survivors' demand for justice and their, their descendants. No such thing for the Japanese. No such thing. And uh, Abe, his, uh, on his mother's side, his grandfather was put in prison at one time for being a suspected Class A war criminal. And many of the military people who were involved in Comfort Women, including uh, Nakasone, Prime Minister Nakasone, who wrote in his biography of how proud he was for building a comfort station. In a, in, he said it was a beautiful building. You know, and they're perpetuating the right-wing uh, mindset. Uh, why should we care? Um, four reasons. The hatred continues. The wounds have never healed. I've witnessed at least three or four um, riots, very violent riots in mainland China, and where cars were overturned, um, where uh, windows were smashed, where anyone looking Japanese was a target. And I was afraid for the Japanese reporters, you know. Um, and uh, the hatred goes so deep, in part because they learn about Japanese war crimes and comfort women from a young age. The Japanese in Japan, they don't learn anything, right? My siblings and my sister-in-law. We didn't learn in history, in our Eurocentric history books about comfort women. And so that's why when my mom told me in 1991 when I was 15, turning 16, I was so floored, I was shocked. And it, it, um, it led me to search for um, more of this information in the history books. And um, you know, I went to the library, searched every index of the books on World War II, nothing, nothing. And I thought, how can that be? Isn't that so strange? Like it happened, but why isn't it not in my textbooks? I didn't understand uh, you know, Eurocentric or Japan-centric textbooks at the time. And, um, and that, you know, but when I started researching this, I realized, wow, it touches me. You know, as a Korean person, but as a woman. And, um, you know, when I interviewed uh, the former UN Special Rapporteur, Gay McDougall, in 1999, she's a well-known human rights lawyer, um, and uh, as a Special Rapporteur at the UN, she wrote um, the second report, very long report, on the Japanese military sex slavery system. And, uh, these are very clear, hard-hitting reports. And Rita Cuomo Suari, um, she wrote the first one. And uh, Gay McDougall told me over the phone that the Japanese spent a lot of money trying to bury her report at the United Nations. And um, that, that shocked me. And I, I realized as a junior reporter that I had stumbled on a story that was so important, too important for me to let go. And, um, and then I wrote an op-ed in 2001, and then I found out through my friend or my colleague who was considered um, one of the best investigative reporters in the city, and he received a call from another journalist who was hired by the Japanese consulate in Vancouver to find out information about who I was, because I was beginning to write about this issue and bringing shame, I, I guess. And, uh, and that made me realize, wow. And that's why I wrote my book, 
um, under a pen name uh, to protect myself from, from right-wing persecution. Um, so this is an 80-year-old man um, burning himself in Seoul, Korea um, because of the, you know, the Japanese going to Yasukuni. Um, and these uh, former survivors in Seoul uh, are still fighting over 70 years every Wednesday. Uh, I think it's, it's now closer to 2,000 demonstrations. Um, since uh, the mid-90s or, or late-90s, uh, they've been demonstrating in front of the Japanese embassy, and that's where the statue um, is as well. I mean, it's such a well-known spot. It, tourists go there all the time. Japanese tourists go there <laughs> regularly. You know, that's how you know, well-known it is. And uh, it's, it's quite a beautiful statue and, and really a monument to peace, uh, in my view. Um, so their, their quest for justice, this is Kim Sun Dok in DC when I first met her. Um, the woman on the right is um, someone from Korean Youth United. Um, you know, so it's galvanized the Asian American community politically, this issue. Uh, I'm just shocked that, um, you know, in 2017 we're still, we're still dealing with this. You know, when this press conference was in 2001. You know, I'm, you know, I, I would rather not be talking about this right now and advocating for um, an apology, you know, in, in 2017. Uh, history is repeating itself. ISIS and Boko Haram, um, it's really a continuation of the military, Japanese military sex slavery system, and where they're, you know, they're really, um, you know, passing these women around, selling them. And, you know, like many of the, the comfort women survivors were, were sold by either family members or brokers. Um, you know, we need to stop this cycle. And uh, if Korea, China, Japan, and the other nations cannot agree on this issue, comfort women, Japanese military sex slavery, how can they cooperate to end modern day sex trafficking? There are 4.5 million girls and women who are being trafficked. And one NGO said, and I couldn't confirm it before this talk, that the highest number of, of foreign women being trafficked into the United States is Korean women. And uh, I, I will try to um, confirm that. Uh, but, uh, you know, and we do need to heal old wounds. We need to heal these deep generational wounds like the TRC, um, although it, you know, it wasn't, a perfect model, um, but you know at least some of the issues, some of the hatred and the crimes were were brought out into the open. And uh, perhaps we also need to address um, slavery in the U.S. You know there was never reconciliation. There was emancipation, but not really reconciliation. And uh, what else is being done to help? Um, you saw the movie, the grassroots reconciliation effort. Um, that's what some of us believe that perhaps a grassroots movement in Japan um, may be one way for the Japanese government to um, bring closure, bring closure for the women. Um, and uh, these women's faces before the apology were, um, you know, haunted. It was dark. It was, um, you know, they were in anguish. But you know that their faces brightened because they received recognition uh, in a substitutional kind of way. Um, and, and it can never replace an official government apology, of course. But look how bright her face is after she received um, you know, a story that, that really meant something, you know, that, that touched their hearts. And uh, my film and book are in the New Nanjing Comfort Women Museum. Um, the government officials were so touched by the Japanese team um, that they felt that they wanted to include it in, in their museum. And I'm, you know, we're really thankful for that message of you know, healing and reconciliation to be um, there. Uh, because in China, there's a lot of movies, um, you know, a lot of movies, a lot of TV series on this issue. Uh, but there's no solution that's being offered. And, um, and oops, sorry, this is, uh, that's the statue of, um, uh, Pak Young Shim, she was the in the photo, the first photo that I showed you, the pregnant woman. Um, Pak Young Shim was actually the one who verified that this 
group of six buildings was the comfort station that she was um, enslaved in, in Nanjing. And she's from North Korea, and she was able to travel in her 70s uh, all the way to Nanjing, and then she went to Myanmar to the other comfort station. It was part of her pilgrimage and, um, and bringing closure. I have a thin book of North Korean survivor stories. I can, I can give it to you, Helen, um, for the task force if you want. Um, but this, this man, uh, he's a government official, and his heart is so amazing. It, we, we both wept you know, for the women, because it, everything we do, it has to be all about the women, and to remember them, to honor them, to bring them healing. And um, I just, yeah, Chen is his name. I just really um, honor him. I, I really love, love his, his heart and his work. Um, and uh, the man in the middle is an adopted son of a, of a comfort woman survivor. Um, and here we are, uh, you know, this is the wall of, of uh, suffering you know, when you first come into this museum. Um, the, the same people who produced and managed the Nanjing, the Rape of Nanjing Museum, they were the ones to also manage and set up the Comfort Woman Japanese Military Sex Labor Museum. Um, so it's important to commemorate these women, um, you know, as a monument to peace, as a monument to never again. Let's never again allow this to happen on our watch. Um, also, one important note, these women mostly do not like to be called cover women because it's such a um, loaded derogatory term. Um, I, I use it because the public can recognize it. That's the only reason why I use it. But if I were to be speaking to survivors, I would never, I would never use that term. Um, and so my book, um, it took me about 10 years to collect uh, interviews because I was still working as a journalist and um, really wanted to give up this topic because it's, it's, it's just so depressing. It's so depressing. You know, I, I just thought, why me, Lord? You know, I want to give, I, I just don't want to do this. Um, but uh, I, I think it's a calling. You know, it's a calling. It's, it was, um, you know, a choice I had to make. I can live a comfortable life, and I could have. Because I like fashion, and I like, you know, dining, fine dining, and I, you know, and, and but as a professional, as a privileged woman, and, and the reason why I wept with Chen at the Chinese um, Nanjing Museum was, here I was as a privileged woman. I could fly in here. I could fly out. But these women from all over Asia, Koreans, Taiwanese, Chinese, Myanmar, Malaysians, East Timorese, Indonesians, they were dragged by ship, you know, sometimes train, by force. And so I felt compelled, I was challenged that to give up the white picket fence. You know, me and my husband, we don't want the white picket fence lifestyle. We want to stand for the voiceless. So that, that's what I do. I train, I train people in Hong Kong on how to speak on comfort women. I campaigned in universities and schools, um, you know, trying to get other people to do things. One uh, Korean national, um, a young girl who is an art history major, is setting up uh, an art exhibit in Hong Kong on, on this topic with artists from Korea. Um, you know, it's, it's really important to have films. You know, one um, filmmaker, uh, I said, take my book, you can use whatever stories. Um, you know, hope, please inject a reconciliation thing, please. <laughs> and uh, let's, let's have that, you know, with, with this issue. You know, just like Eli Wiesel was able to, um, you know, encourage the flourishing of uh, magazine articles, books, films, TV series. Um, you know, I dream of seeing that with this issue. Know, so that we will never forget what happened to the most vulnerable. These are the women from the poorest of the poor. In Taiwan, the Japanese preyed on the Aboriginal marginalized community, right? So yeah, that's, that's the dream. And so what's still needed? A sincere apology to allow uh, the wounds from over 70 years ago to heal once and for all. And we dream of, uh, myself, my husband, a former MP from Holland, um, and some other people who are involved politically and human rights experts were dreaming of a healing conference 
led by survivors? What if it's at you know, the President Jimmy Carter Center and we bring in people like President Jimmy Carter, Desmond Tutu, you know, states, men and women, who can bring the Japanese government to the table. And, and the point is not to shame them, not to make them feel any guilt, because we want them to be able to issue an apology that's sincere and that's not forced. But what if we were able to do this before the remaining, the dwindling number of survivors die? What if? What if it's in Atlanta? I mean, someone said, oh, let's have it in The Hague. And, but what if, you know, it's here because of, you know, Jimmy Carter and the legacy of Martin Luther King. And um, I don't know, I'm just throwing it out to you. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're open. And uh, let's, let's stop the cycle of sex slavery. Uh, in China, there are many North Korean women who are forced into cyber pornography and or uh, sold as, as brides. And I've interviewed um, several of them. And it is one of the most depressing stories I've ever, ever, ever heard. And, uh, and, and there are so many courageous um, missionaries who are risking their lives in the Underground Railroad to you know, help these women. But what about America, right? We need to stop the cycle of sex slavery here. Atlanta is one of the largest hubs for human trafficking in America. And the world is helping so few of them, less than 0.1%, right? How can that be? We've got the most cutting edge technology, um, there's so many professionals, so many you know, do-gooders and, and altruistic people, a lot of millennials want to help, you know? Why? And um, so a few years ago, uh, I started um, a nonprofit uh, that was out of my church uh, called the A52 Freedom Campaign. A52 is the area code for Hong Kong, and uh, I, with my husband, we we mobilized um, over 20,000 people in over 55 events um, to do something, to initiate projects, to initiate fundraising. Uh, we supported them. And it was about mobilizing ordinary people and, you know, to fight human trafficking, to fight uh, or advocate for the Japanese military sex slavery survivors. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's our dream to, um, you know, see America step up, to see people, you know, all over the world. And, um, you know, what, what a, uh, a timely issue to galvanize around the historical military sex slavery. Uh, if we can, um, you know, tap into this so that it, it doesn't just end with this issue, but we we fight for, we help the Korean women and the Chinese women and the Vietnamese women who are being trafficked into the United States, or even you know Americans and Canadians who are being trafficked out as well to to Asia. There are many boys actually trafficked to the Middle East because they they want to um, you know they prefer boys in the Middle East. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, really was an honor. And uh, if you have any questions, um, I don't know if there's time for Q&A, but I can stay around with Ross um, if you have any questions. I uh, really want to honor Helen, Kim Ho, and the task force for what you're doing. It is, it's so, it's um, history making, really. And you won't regret anything you've done. Because um, every bit counts. And I'm just hoping that uh, there will be a change of heart with the Civil Rights Museum that um, they'll recognize uh, that this issue, that the women, it's about the women, and uh, not to cave in to any kind of pressure or intimidation tactic from a government. Thank you.